Hello and welcome to episode 222 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan and today we have a very, very special guest, one of the oldest and best friends of the show. He's coming off yet another top 10 finish in the expert rankings competition. It's only 2 p.m. Eastern right now, so he's not on peyote or tequila yet, although you couldn't tell by his beard. It is our own Pat Thorman. Thorman, how's it going, buddy? It's going pretty good. I'm looking forward to that peyote and tequila in, in, uh, in a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on, today, on today's show, we are going to talk about pace. I think much like offensive line play, which, by the way, we covered with Thorne last week, pace analysis is underrepresented relative to the impact it has on fantasy football. If you've ever done a projection, you know that the place to start is is just straight, well, how many plays is a team going to run in this game? And that's more complicated than it sounds, right? How often will they go hurry up? Will they bleed the play clock down every time? Do they sustain their normal pace when they're trailing? And there's a lot more that goes into it. Thorman has been studying this stuff for years. We're going to dive into 2021 pace outlooks today. Before we get into that, I wanted to remind everyone that if you have a fantasy draft coming up, we can help. Our draft kit is just $34.99, includes Silva's top 150, tiers, team-by-team previews, sleepers, busts, my perfect draft, favorite flyers, abusing the default rankings, Thorne's offensive line rankings, Thorman's pace preview, everything we think you need to win at your draft. Second, if you have already purchased a draft kit, please take the free underdog money. You are entitled to $10.00. As an existing user, $35 if you are new. Just go to the best ball tab on the site. Under underdog, you'll see an article titled How to Claim Your Underdog Credit. Would be very silly not to take the free money. All right, let's get into it. First of all, before we get into the pace stuff, shout out to Thorman, as I mentioned, for another top 10 finish in the rankings contest. This is really hard. There's over 100 people that enter it every year. This is Thorman's sixth top 10 finish in the last eight years. The people need to know, Thorman, how are you so successful in being so accurate in the rankings each year? Well, I don't got much of a social life, um, but uh, you know, it's a lot, of, uh, you know, a lot of tequila on Friday nights looking at things and then a lot of tinkering on Sunday mornings. Um, it's probably more plus EV for you know, the rankings accuracy and our ETR subscribers uh, than my own DFS lineups on Sunday morning to be doing so much tinkering. But you know, I watch your and Evan's show and uh, just you know, tinker right up until uh, right up to lock. Yeah. I mean, just being on top of everything, defense, kickers, tight ends, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Shout out to Thorman. Of course, his rankings are part of our in-season package. Shout out to us. Looking forward to another year of Thorman crushing those. Okay. On to pace. So the question that people want to know is differences from last year, right? Because we can obviously go back and find the pace and think about how teams played last year. Who are a team or teams you think are way likelier to play faster than they did last season? I think the first one that kind of comes to mind is is the Seahawks. I mean, there's been a pretty steady drumbeat uh, this offseason. Now that Shane Waldron's there, how how much faster that they're going to play. Um, You know, Russ was talking about uh, he's going to have no huddle sprinkled in throughout the game and not just in the fourth quarter. Um, he's calling his own plays throughout the game. Uh, Lockett was saying the other day that he has, Russ has 40 to 50 plays now that he can call versus about 15 that he had in the past. Um, and then we've, we've all been burned by Pete, you know, losing his nerve before we got to happen last year, you know, almost predictably. Um, but it seems like it's got a little more legs uh, this time. There's probably a little more fire, fire to the smoke. Um, but at, at bare minimum, it's going to be faster and it's more voluminous from a play volume standpoint than the second half of last year. Um, hopefully it does sustain for the full year, but if nothing else, it's going to be a boost uh, relative to what we saw in like November and, and December last year. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the offensive coordination, my first reaction was when, when Sean Hammer got fired was, it was like, this dude tried to throw the ball too much. And they were like, oh my God, we got to slow down. We got to run more. We got to play better defense. Let's get rid of Schottenheimer. But then Waldron comes in. Do you have any feel on how much more control Waldron will have and why the headbutting with Schottenheimer was going on? Well, I mean, I think you got to, I mean, you got to have a little more faith because they, they did bring in another guy who kind of has a similar profile, at least from a, a, a past heavier, you know, uh, uh, up-tempo type of um, angle. Um, and I think, 
he realized that maybe, maybe hopefully he realized that, you know, it didn't work when he put on the brakes last year. Like the defense played a little bit better, but um, the offense completely, completely cratered, like we said. So I think, you know, he, maybe he learned his lesson. Maybe it's tough to say for sure. Tough to, for an old dog to learn new tricks, I guess. But um, it seems like everything has really shifted this off season. And um, hope, like, again, hopefully this has got a little more legs than, than, uh, than last year's. Yeah. I- I've been taking Tyler Lockett a lot in, round four i think russ is fine when he gets to me in like round seven or eight i think metcalf is fine at the end of round two although i think it's a little steep the gap between him and lockett might be a little bit too much how are you thinking about seahawks players in general now i'll be i'm, I'm fine with with those guys with metcalf toward you know toward the end of the second beginning of the third um gerald gerald everett is actually um a pretty decent target. Um, he's not not expensive, and they were talking about how they uh, want to get the ball out of Russ's hands quicker. So not necessarily all those deep shots. They want to work the intermediate yeah. part, intermediate part of the field a little bit more. So that could kind of you know kind of help him out as well. Plus, he's got yeah. a little bit of familiarity with Waldron from from the Rams. Sure, that that's been the biggest thing that I've noticed is they kind of blamed last year's second half downturn on hey we need to get the ball out of Russ's hands quicker and not run so many deep routes. Defenses were prepared. They were just sitting deep and letting Metcalf and Lockett come to them. Now they're going to play more underneath so i think that's good for catch rate that's good for ppr any other teams that you think are going to play way faster than last year uh, well uh, jacksonville is is one that kind of comes a little more of a projection obviously because now they've been they've been slow and, and and low play volume for for quite a while i um, mean it might take a beat to kind of show itself you know because it's such a you know kind of a new team all around um but i think that they're going to rise a little bit in pace and, and certainly in play volume um, if you look at Daryl Bevel, who's now the OC here, when he took over in Detroit as offensive coordinator, the, um, the Lions had been dead last in pace. And then in 2019, they were a little bit above average. And then last year, they played even faster. And then once Bevel took over as head coach, interim head coach for Patricia, they got even faster. Um, and no Trevor Lawrence and Etienne had some success playing the tempo of Clemson. Um, Marvin Jones comes over with Bevel from Detroit. So that's some continuity. There's continuity on uh, the Jags offensive line because so they're, they're all they're all the same five starters um obviously Urban Meyer is the wild card here we really don't know exactly what he's going to bring um but even he has some some experience um with some spread up tempo um from his time in, in Florida um so I I think that it's really under the radar um not many people are talking about that people have some some hope for the offense basically because of Lawrence but I think they might he might be backed up a little bit by a by a better pace yeah I think that's super interesting and someone I think that uh, I've maybe been too low on early in the process. So I'm warming to now is Travis Etienne. I, I think that this is the kind of running back that I want to be on first round draft capital can run between the tackles, but excels in the pass game. Like this is the dream, the Camara, uh, uh, Christian McCaffrey, uh, DeAndre Swift type players. That's who I want to be taking at running back. And so I've probably been too low, too low on Travis Etienne. Also, I mean, this division, like the Colts are kind of falling apart. I mean, we know the Texans are a total train wreck. Jaguars have a chance to actually be legit good and compete to win this division. And I think NTA will be a big part of that. So he's a guy that I've been on and I, I, like, I'm i trying to get more on lately. And same with LaVisca Chenault. I think he's the guy that I want ahead of Chark, ahead of uh, Marvin Jones for me. And Trevor Lawrence has a really soft schedule to start. I know Evans talked about that a lot. He's moved Trevor Lawrence up in the top 150. I think Trevor Lawrence can start fast as well. So add in the pace, th- the pace possibilities. I like it. All right. So we have Seattle and Jacksonville as teams Thorman think can play faster than last year. What about a team or team Thorman team or teams you think will play slower than they did last year? Well, it's, it's crazy to say, but the Vikings, um, and they, because they didn't really even play particularly fast last year, it was kind of just fast for them. Um, their defense cratering produced uh, some decent shootouts, um, and they wind up averaging the 19th most plays per game, which obviously is not all that, nothing to write home about, but that's up from 27th the year before and the 22nd the year before that. Um, they, they still operated only the 25th fastest uh, situation neutral pace, but now you've got a defense that should be rebounding. You've got an offensive line that's been solidified. Um, and that, you know, that, that kind of screams more, even more running, um, you know, to, to a guy like Zimmer. Um, and that's going to equal, you know, fewer, fewer of those barn burner shootouts than last year. So, I mean, fortunately, it's a pretty tight target and touch tree there. Um, but I, w- I wouldn't be going digging for ancillary options you know, in Minnesota because I think the, the, the play volume is going to be uh, back down into the, into the you know, low 20s um, as far as uh, rankings. Yeah, and that's something that we've been fighting. You know, I've been encouraging us to get higher on Irv Smith and we just try to go through the math and it's like, man, it's harder to get higher on Irv Smith without outrageous efficiency. Their plays 
are just not there. Adam Thielen, Justin Jefferson, Dalvin Cook take up so many of the touches in a low play volume. But man, I think Irv Smith's going to be really involved around the goal line. So I still like Irv Smith, but yeah, you're going to need touchdown efficiency for sure. I'd also agree, say I agree with you that Minnesota's defense is going to be way, way, way better this year. They do have a very soft schedule to start also. But yeah, I mean, it is tight. So I mean, Jefferson and Thielen, I think are fine. I agree with you that Irv is maybe thinner than people think going to need the touchdown efficiency. Anybody else slower or you want ready to move on? Um, yeah, well, we can move on. I mean, we really wanted to talk about some uh, teams that maybe the public thinks yeah. is the best, but, um, but they, they, they could, be, uh, could be wrong. I think uh, the Saints kind of stand out here. It's like not, really, not really sure if the expectation is that the Saints are going to play fast, but I think the public still likes them just because they're so used to liking them. Um, but you know, even last year, they, they were already extremely pass-averse. And, and slow pace to make a bottom five in, in both metrics. Um, and they played even slower when Drew Brees was out. They ran fewer plays when Drew Brees was out. Um, and their play volume was okay due to kind of Brees driven efficiency. I mean, they were 10th in snaps per game, but any drop in efficiency there, um, and you got a broken passing game. You have, I basically have no receivers going right now. You don't know if Taysom Hill's going to be killing passes. I mean, any drop in efficiency can really bottom out that play volume from, from 10th way down into the 20s. Um, and you know, I'm, I just, I'm just not sure the public is quite there on, on, on the Saints, the downside for the Saints right now. Yeah, we've talked a lot about how we think there's at least some chance. You know, the offensive line is very good. Coaching is very good. But there's some chance, 20, 25% chance the offense just absolutely craters. And playing slow, you know, you saw it last year with New England. When you have major quarterback problems, when you have wide out problems, you can try to win with offensive line and defense. Part of that, though, is playing really, really slow. And, you know, you saw that. And so I agree with you. You can definitely see that with the Saints. What about somebody maybe the public is thinks is going to play fast, but they're or play slow, but they're actually going to play fast. This is this is one of the ones I'm pretty pretty in on. It's it's, it's Washington, um, and then they're they're thought of as as a defensive team, and and they are, um, but they're not thought of as like an up pace, high volume, high play volume team. Um, whereas last year they were ninth in pace, eighth in uh, snaps per game, and tenth in a uh, situation neutral pass rate. Um, now, of course, a lot of those passes were glorified handoffs, um, but you know Scott Turner is still there. I mean, he even got Cam Newton mm-hmm. to, to be thrown to his running backs a couple of years ago in Carolina. Um, and so the defense is obviously really good. So they're they're going to hold down opposition plays. So this isn't like a a huge fantasy friendly environment for both teams. But I mean, you got Washington playing fast on offense, defense getting the ball back quick. Like Washington's going to run a ton of plays, um, and I know we don't like to look too far down the pike, but their fantasy playoff schedule is Dallas, Philly, Dallas, Philly, um, and so you're looking at you know two up pace games with Dallas for sure. You know, both teams have suspect secondaries. We're not exactly sure on Philly's pace with Sirianni is kind of an unknown, but I mean if you're looking for a solution for like kind of a contrarian large field best ball tournament that has a, some playoff upside. Washington, I mean, obviously Gibson, you've got to be in the right draft position to get him. But other than that, everyone's very affordable. Um, so I think that it's worth throwing a few darts at, uh, at WFT. Oh, buddy, you, you, you are really making it move. I mean, I, I've been on Washington. God, I mean, I was taking Washington to win the NFC East. Washington win total over. I've been in on Gibson and McLaurin and Fitz and Diami and Logan. I mean... I think they're going to be very, very good. I feel like it's a little worrisome that the early season schedule is a bit soft because like they could not be that good early in the season and lose some games and maybe people panic a little bit. But yeah, I mean, they're going to get it. They're going to get it together as long as Ryan Fitzpatrick can stay healthy. Love that one. All right. I do want to get to listener questions, but there's a few other teams we have to talk about here. I think Cincinnati is one. We saw them play very fast, I believe, last year when Joe Burrow was healthy for the first 10 games. Now he's coming off the injury, but they add Jamar Chase signaling an intent to play even more aggressively on offense. What do you think about Cincinnati's pace outlook for 2021? Love it. Um, you know, and I think most people have seen those Joe Burrow splits by now. I know we, we've both been tweeting them out several times um, this offseason. Um, you know, they dropped from first in pass rate to 23rd. Um, they've scored more than a touchdown, you know, a few points per game uh, without Burrow. And they went from first to 31st in plays per game and uh, eighth quickest to third slowest in pace. But the key for me there is, is it, wasn't, it wasn't a fluke. I mean, in, in Zach Taylor's first year, they were seventh in pace and, and ninth in, in plays per game. So, I mean, while there's some concern over the, the division being a pretty good defensive division, and we've had a slow start here in, in the camp, um, but 
I think that might actually even work into our, our advantage just to kind of slow down the ADP that this Cincinnati ADP was screaming um, mm-hmm. in, in spring. So, um, I, but I, at the very least, I think we're going to be confident there's going to be a fast, you know, highly voluminous offense at, at minimum with some upside from there. Yeah, and that week one game, and obviously when DraftKings released their week one salary, one of the first things that stood out to me and everybody was how cheap the Bengals were. I mean, insultingly cheap on the Bengals. They do play Minnesota in week one. I'll be interested to see your thoughts in there in the week one article on how that game's going to go. In terms of pace, we've already talked about Minnesota. We know Cincinnati wants to play fast. I hope they can keep Burrow up. I mean, go back and listen to the pod with Thorne. I think there's some optimism on keeping Burrow clean, but yeah, still a trouble spot for sure. Uh, What about... Carolina. We talked about the the Washington already. Obviously, some ties there to Carolina. Carolina played very fast last. And look, I mean, even though Teddy wasn't good last year, he still supported. I mean, three very viable fantasy plays a week. Mike Davis, typically Robbie and DJ Moore. What do you think about Carolina's pace outlook with Darnold in the mix? It, it, it's to be honest with you, it's it's a tough one. I mean, I really don't know what to expect. I mean, especially after last year, and we thought that you know, with Matt Rule and Joe Brady coming in. Um, they were going to play fast you know, based on the expectations from LSU. Just we, That was a pretty much locked in expectation that they were going to play fast. And then they were the fourth slowest paced team. Um, perhaps they were trying to protect that young defense. Um, but, you know, hopefully in the second year together, you know, they're, they're going to they're go a little bit faster. And even a small increase in tempo is going to boost those plays up. They were 26 in plays per game. Um, and for all Sam Darnold's faults, you know, even – when he was starting out games in those, in those scripted no huddle plays, he didn't look terrible. So maybe if you get some instinctual play going with him, just just knows the, knows the play, gets up, snap. Maybe you can feed off of that. I, I'm really not sure, but um, this is this is a tough one for me. I don't have a strong lean either way, but I'm I'm certainly less confident than it was last year that they're going to play fast. I mean, one thing that you can say and coaches do, and I mean, I know we've talked about this before, but like when I was in high school I, I, and we were playing basketball, our team, I mean, we were not very good. We were not very talented. We played as slow as humanly possible because every p- more possessions for the other team meant more chances to extrapolate their edge over us. So we played so slow. I mean, we were trying to win games like 40 to 35 and stuff like that. And it was embarrassing how slow we played, but you know, it was the best way for us to win. I think some coaches, they say, hey, we're not as good as these other teams. Let's just try to play as slow as possible and lower the number of possessions, increase the variance by lowering the number of possessions. And maybe that's what Carolina does. But I think they have confidence in Darnold. Like, I mean, I know this sounds crazy, man, but I think a lot of quarterback play can be hidden with wide receiver play. In other words, like you saw Tom Brady really struggle when he was with New England with total dust ball wide receivers. He goes to Tampa with Godwin, Evans, and Antonio Brown, and Gronk and lights the field on fire, right? And I'm not going to say Darnold's going to light the field on fire, but with Robbie, Terrace Marshall, DJ Moore, Christian McCaffrey, I think he'll be fine and just getting away from Adam Gase. So maybe they step on it a little bit, just they have confidence in Darnold, more confidence than the public has in Darnold. I think that's for sure. I don't know. Am I out of my mind? No, I don't think you're out of your mind at all. I mean, it, it makes sense. I mean, even just to starting a game with a couple of dump offs to Chris McCaffrey is a good way to get your confidence up. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I mean, and they definitely have a pretty decent ceiling. And like I said, I don't think they need to play that much faster to get some more volume in that offense. Let's talk about another quarterback change. Matthew Stafford is now with the Rams. They have the Cam Akers injury. And I think they kind of think of Cam Akers as more of a workhorse pounder back. Daryl Henderson, the kind of back that I prefer personally, a more space back a more pass catching oriented back. I don't know how you think if at all that affects their pace, but Stafford coming in, I think certainly affects their pace. What do you think the Rams outlook is? Oh yeah, I completely agree. I mean, the Jerry Goff training wheels are going to, are going to come off at this point. I mean, and the Rams always seem to run a lot of plays, um, but last year their efficiency traded and that was obviously directly attributable to, to Goff's play. Um, they, they were down to 15th in snaps pace which also is part of that golf training rules uh, that, that, that McVay was running. I and mean, the year before, years before that, they were second, seventh, and second. Um, and so they got Stafford in there. He's got plenty of experience running no huddle. Uh, Detroit led the league a few years ago in no huddle rate. Um, and plus, and they, they've got four up-paced division games and then the AFC South. So uh, things are really clicking on, on, on from several different fronts for them. Um, so And even though they have some ancillary options, I think they're going to have the, the play volume to support them as well. Yeah, no, and, and I like the Rams. I've been taking a ton of Daryl Henderson. Talked about that on Monday's pod, how his ADP is getting creeping up, but we're still ahead of market on that. I also take a lot of Tyler Higby for sure. Everybody assumes they know how Dallas is going to play. I mean, they have Dak back. They have the offensive line back. What could possibly go wrong for Dallas 
this year. I know you follow the Cowboys pretty closely. This is it seems like a no-brainer. Anything to say about Dallas's outlook now that they have their pieces back? Uh, just knock on wood that they stay healthy. I mean, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it. It's, 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 it's to the moon, really. Um, you know, in, in Dak's five starts, they were first in pace, first in plays, second no huddle, third in points. Um, and they even played fast-ish under Andy Dalton. Um, that's just the Kellen Moore offense, um, and McCarthy didn't screw it up. Uh, so, you know, they should again be in shootouts, you know, based obviously on their own offense, and they have a, still have a suspect secondary. So, um, yeah, there's really nothing that's going to slow them down barring further injuries. The only thing is I'm, I'm a little worried about using those splits with Dak because if you remember those games specifically, I mean, they would get down by like 30 points in those games, like not not even close. I mean, they were getting wrecked, and then Dak would end up with like 60 pass attempts. I know we adjust all this, all these stats for neutral situation and stuff like that, but does it give you any pause that they were getting absolutely blasted in those games when Dak was healthy last year? I guess it's definitely worth mentioning. I mean, I know the first game was actually, was, was, wasn't even that high scoring as it was at LA. Um, but then those subsequent four were, were ridiculous bananas. Um, yeah. But I mean, I don't see the defense as being that much better this year that, that they're not going to be in shootouts, especially if they're playing so fast themselves because it's they, the, the script flips and they get up two touchdowns. All of a sudden, you, your opponent is playing fast, coming, trying to come back. So I, I think they have enough of a catalyst on their own offense plus their own pace to just to spawn those shootouts. Arizona, uh, everybody assumes you get into shootouts because you have Kyler Murray. They did add Rondell Moore, who I like. They did add A.J. Green, who, you know, we'll see what A.J. Green has left in the tank. Based on last year, it looks like not much, but we shall see. What do you think about Arizona? You got to look at them very similar to the Cowboys, you know, just locked in pace, locked in play volume. Um, Dallas and Arizona had the most combined plays in their games last year. Um, Arizona uh, was first in situation with the pace and first in play volume each of the last two seasons. They also have a suspect secondary. Um, again, they're in a division with two other up pace teams. That's you know, plus the AFC South. That's half their schedule um, right there is, is, is favorable. Um, it's kind of just wheels up all around. And, and I know they swapped out fits for AJ Green. So at least you have somebody to make fun of, you know, all year for being pet calcified. <laughs> yeah, I actually think, I mean, I, I know what you're saying, but I actually think the direct swap is, should be Larry Fitz to Rondell Moore. They were throwing Larry Fitz idiotically, these like bubble screens and like quick hitters and be like, oh, Larry, go do something after the catch, which is a disaster. I mean, throw that to Rondell Moore and let him go nuts. And maybe I'm biased. I have a bet on Rondell Moore over 500 and a half receiving yards but i do think that all those bubble screens should go to rondell Moore this year nice, all right that. yeah we're in count our money already okay uh let's get to some listener questions here got a bunch of good ones we're gonna do five. First one from best ball ratings he says atlanta played fast last season tennessee played even faster if arthur smith ups the tempo even more in atlanta it seems like a good bet matt ryan again leads the nfl in attempts with a ne- fairly narrow target tree would love to hear holes poked in this analysis. Thanks. Can you poke holes in this analysis on Atlanta with Arthur Smith? Can't poke too many holes in that. I mean, I, I agree with it. You know, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing what Smith does in Atlanta. I mean, their defense is almost certainly going to suck as much as Tennessee's did last year. Um, and Tennessee's offensive pace last year contributed to their defense giving up the third most plays, um, which created a good offensive environment for, you know, for both teams. Um, and Tennessee last year went fast despite you know running a ton which is bullish for Atlanta because they're probably not going to run as much. Um, Matt Ryan's used to playing fast. He's used to playing with no huddle. Tennessee had the third most no huddle last year. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to argue with that. I, I want to see that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that because they're going to play a lot of two wide receiver sets and two tight end with Hurst and Pitts, it makes people think that they could slow it down a bit. But I, don't, I agree with you. I don't think they have even think about, hey, let's run the ball a ton. I mean, when you Mike Davis – is your is your RB1 and Quadra Allison is your RB2. You can't be expecting to run the ball a ton. So yeah, you know, I think Matt Ryan, um, I don't like taking pure pocket passers, but in terms of streamer, in terms of a DFS spiked week, in terms of best ball, I could see Matt Ryan paying it off in stacks with Pitts or Ridley. And I like Pitts and Ridley both a ton. I'm out on Mike Davis though. You can listen to the bus pod for more on that. Question two from Ryan. He says, when it comes to pace of play, are there any commonalities we should be looking for year over year in these teams, i.e. rookie starting quarterbacks, 
coaches looking for advantages, new coaches coming from other fast paced systems, offenses facing better defenses, looking for an edge. I guess Ryan's basically asking, what can we look for year over year that's sticky in pace? Well, I think you, I think you nailed it with you know, coaches coming from other fast paced systems. I mean, you know, most up tempo or, or, or slow paced teams are kind of coach and or quarterback driven. Um, you look at Chip Kelly back at Oregon and Philly and San Francisco. Um, Tom Brady's a good example on the quarterback side. I mean, every single season he was in New England, they were at the very top of the pace standings. And then he went to a Bruce Arians offense, which was slow, like mid pack or even slower. And you're wondering, you know, who's going to kind of carry that pace. And it was, it was Brady. They were the fastest offense from mid season on last year at Tampa. Um, so I, I think the, the looking at, you know, coaches and, and adding quarterbacks to that is, is probably a pretty safe way to go. Um, maybe something like pass heavy teams tend to be more a pace relative to, you know, run heavy teams. That's just based on you know, the clock going all the time. But I think that the coach quarterback correlation um, is, is pretty strong. From Vitty Smalls, he says, the teams with poor offensive lines tend to pick up the pace since they're constantly under pressure. There's some examples of this. I mean, we mentioned Burrow already, one of the worst offensive lines in the league last year. Bengals were playing at a very high pace with Burrow. We've seen other teams go hurry up when they have poor offensive line play, like the Steelers, I think, went to a lot of hurry up last year. Do you think there's any correlation there between poor offensive line and fast play? I, I couldn't say for sure. I know that you know, using tempo does mute pass rushes. Um, Sometimes like, we've seen, seen coaches talk about that. Um, but like, I guess when you look at the worst of the lines, you try to find a correlation, look at the worst of the lines. Some of them aren't teams that play fast. Some of them aren't teams that play slow. Um, but I mean, I guess if you, if, you can't, if you can't block consistently, it doesn't really matter how fast you play. I mean, you're just going to be hurrying up to punt or, you know, or worse. Um, but I, I think there's something to it, but I can't say for sure that there's a direct correlation. Yeah, that's certainly a narrative. And, and it's... I, I agree with you. I don't know if it's true or not, but I think some coaches think it, and with, if coaches execute on that, that is the most important thing. Speaking of rookies, uh, Jeff says, the love for Justin Fields is just, but would a switch to him from Andy Dalton actually improve Chicago's pace of play with the running game likely playing a considerable role as he adjusts? We didn't talk about the Bears. What do you think their outlook is, and how do you think their pace would be different between Fields and Dalton? Um, well, I guess, you know, Dalton probably has the better chance of running at a quicker pace right off the bat just because he's a veteran. I'm sure Nagy trusts him right away. Um, I guess it's hard to say how long it's going to take Nagy to trust Fields to that, to that level or even to the level of, you know, Mitch Trubisky, who he, I mean, he actually let Trubisky play with some pace on, on occasion just to kind of find a rhythm, which he's still looking for probably. Um, but I guess typically like more running, I mean, the question I guess was, you know, about running, more running tends to, you know, slow pace and play volume. Um, you know, some teams can do both. Arizona had a high play volume, had a high run rate, um, and still had a high uh, pace and play volume. But that, that's not typical. Um, I guess it, you know, it's it's hard to say, but I, I would probably assume it's just best guess is just going to depend on Nagy's level of faith in the fields and how quickly it develops. Sure. Yeah, and I, and I think you know reports from camp. We've talked a ton about Trey Lance. Haven't talked as much about Justin Fields. Reports from camp on Justin Fields are good. I mean, major arm talent obviously wins in. Mobility, I think Andy Dalton is way likely to start week one than Jimmy Garoppolo is, but still expect Fields in there early, and I still like taking Fields. You can get him, as the Lance hype builds, you can get Fields way later than you can get Lance right now. Last question. As legalized sports betting spreads across America, Pat, we're going to get more questions like this from early value NFL. He says, when a fast-paced team plays a slow-paced team, who would you give the advantage to in that situation? Would you lean toward the under in that spot or the over? It's a good question. You do this article every week where you look at pace and sometimes, a lot of times, it's a team that wants to play fast against a team that wants to play slow. How do you figure out what's going to happen? Who's going to win out in those situations? I mean, these aren't the easiest forecasts to make you know, for obvious reasons, um, but I guess if one team is clearly dominant, you know, that's the team that's usually going to dictate the pace. I mean, they're, they're mostly going to control the game script. They're going to control the ball. Um, obviously, it's tougher when those teams are more evenly matched, um, but I think a good rule of thumb is to is to go with see the faster team is the more dominant team. That's probably how the game script's going to go. They're going to get out to a good lead while playing fast. The, the other team's going to have to play fast to catch up, and vice versa. Um, but I mean, the, with these things, it's usually easier to uh, to successfully predict things at at the tails. Um, you know, that's kind of you know that's it goes for other things, whether it's straight the schedule or run pass ratio. But uh, maybe that's not, that's not a great answer, but um, I guess it really just depends on on how good these teams are and, and, and kind of side with that team. Sure. Yeah. And, and I, you know, like Thorman said, I think the team that 
wins in pace is the team who is better typically obviously it's t- tough to predict in an individual nfl game who's going to win the game but yeah i mean when you can tell hey you know the vikings are very very good let's say and the bengals are very very bad the vikings are probably gonna be able to impose their will and make the game play slower all right be sure to check back during the season thorman has weekly pace write-ups on the games he thinks are interesting from a pace perspective will it play fast Will play slow. His rankings are also updated Wednesday, Friday, Sunday morning as he has no life whatsoever. Thorman, tell the people where they can find you on social. You can find me on Twitter at Pat underscore Thorman. And uh, I will, my presence will be growing as the, uh, as, as, as the month goes along and my house gets sold. And uh, I'll be raring to go by uh, the day after my close, uh, the first day of the, uh, the kickoff, September. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thorman is Thorman is capitalizing on the rabid sellers market in the suburbs. Hashtag how rich. Shout out to you. Okay. For producer Luke, for Thorman, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.